Greg and the other panelists, if we could just make sure that we keep to our 15 minutes. If not, then I have got a megaphone and I'll ask you all to get out of the water. Get everybody out of the water, please. Um, thank you for keeping the time. Greg, over to you. Right, we're in business. Understanding porphyry mineralization as expiration moves from outcropping stockwork quartz veins to more progressively, more deeply buried targets here, Stavely under a field of canola. In the model for staged porphyry evolution developed with the late Terry Leach as long as 20 years ago, uh, we place the porphyry as an hypothesis above a magmatic source, which accounts for much of the metals, which are evolved up into that higher level setting using dilatant features such as sheeted quartz veins. So we've put time in the evolution of porphyries. That model also accounts for, oh, I'm gonna need the pointer. That model also accounts for these out of porphyry features, which we use as vectors towards hidden mineralization. So as our porphyry is first in place, the hot intrusion comes into the war rocks and progressively cools to give us zoned propolytic alteration, which grades inwards from outermost chlorite to epidote, where I'm starting to get a bit interested, to actinolite just before we hit the ore hosting cave feldspar, uh, or hosting potassic alteration comprising cave feldspar, secondary biotite and magnetite here in an intrusion. We might come back to this. This is the first occurrence of actinolite where you would get excited in the discovery drill hole just outside the Ridgeway porphyry. Of the paragenetic sequence of evolving uh, porphyry veins, probably the linear A veins host some of the best early mineralization here a quartz vein with chalcopyrite boronite and a nice K feldspar selvage. But as we go to the later M veins, we start to see that this chalcopyrite is on the partings between the quartz and the magnetite because the model here is this quartz veins formed early and then the chalcopyrite's coming in later as the magmatic source at depth is starting to release its metals up into the higher level porphyry. So our magmatic, magmatic source is going to degas for a minute. We're going to form a barren shoal of advanced argillic alteration and a mineralized tourmaline brechiaite. Now, Terry and I split the different settings of advanced argillic alteration that are generally grouped as a porphyry lithocap into their elements to better get them into our model because they evolve over time and to better consider their relationship as vectors towards mineralization. The first of these we call the barren shoulder that's derived from hot volatile rich fluids and actually sits outside the porphyry so you need to be wise about that. Um, looking at a couple of uh, structurally controlled examples the equi de bon advanced argillic alteration sits outside the horse of our porphyry at Frida River and the lookout rocks ledges sit outside the Ohio Creek porphyry here. Some of them form lithologically controlled alteration here. There's two of these at the uh, North Parks or Ganumla district, which exploit permeable lithologies. At Serra Cathedral, adjacent to the Serra Casale porphyry in the Maracunga belt of, of Chile, um, this what looks like a horizontal zone is actually formed by the coalescence of a whole bunch of uh, advanced argillic selvages developed adjacent to steeply dipping uh, ledges, which are theater structures, if you go up to 5,000 meters and have a look. By con these are volatile rich fluids, but by contrast, a boron rich aqueous fluid may evolve above its magmatic source well into the war rocks before it cools. But as this overpressured fluid evolves higher, into a regime of reduced confining pressure, it may explode. And it explodes and then collapses as a collapsed tourmaline breccia with chalcopyrite in it. And so we see here this um, at the Rio Blanco Los Pontes. On that earlier slide, Rio Blanco is called Andina, uh, colloquially in, in Cadelco. So uh, this huge tourmaline bearing, tourmaline copper bearing breccia pipe system 
uh, contains a combined 24 billion tonnes of copper at uh, copper ore at 0.7 grams uh, percent copper. Two mines, one hydrothermal system attributed to a giant magmatic source of depth. The B and C veins start to illustrate the evolution of fluids from the magmatic source. And then we'll get onto the D veins, which are outside the porphyry and often used as vectors towards mineralization. B veins are defined as having a central termination, which becomes filled by later copper. And that later copper is often termed C veins, he, seen here at Grassberg, which was producing 4% copper and four grams when Terry and I visited some time ago. Note how these veins are parallel because they're sheeted dilatant veins at Ganumbla, they bleed the fluids up into these spine-like intrusions or else where they might bleed fluids up into the war rocks to form a war rock porphyry outside the actual intrusion. I mentioned D veins forming the war rocks. This is a D vein in the high wall off on the margin of above Bingham Canyon and it comprises pyrite and um, quartz. If the porphyry wasn't there, you might regard this as a vector towards mineralization. Just as Sol Gold of views, Chris, um, in a presentation, Steve Garwin pointed out how the presence of outcropping D veins with sericite selvages were important in the exploration history, leading to the discovery of the alpha porphyry at Cascabel. The drilling at Thursday's Gossam at Staveley contained abundant pyritic D veins with the sericite selvage, which kept us um, encouraged. And in fact, the Thursday's Gossam has some oxidized D veins. Chris is going to talk about um, uh, the Staveley belt. I just wanted to mention that the Cayley load sits in a dilatant flexure, which has facilitated the bleeding of fluids from our magmatic source up into that higher crustal level as my segue into area selection. I like to look for dilatant portions of major structures which are often fault jogs. Now I didn't keep the beer coast to where David Lowell explained how when land sedimentary first hit the newsstands in 1975 he traced from El Salvador here up to El Labra and Chuquicamata to eventually find La Escondida. La Escondida is actually a cluster of porphyries because they fit in a regional scale fault job where the Domico fault system steps sideways. These dilatant features in three dimensions pass down from a surficial pull apart basin to sheeted um, epithermal veins to our Staveley flexure to a splay fault at porphyry levels or what the old timers would have prospected, a horsetail system seen here at Chuki Kamada as the D'Amico fault steps sideways to produce our dilatant system to localize the porphyry. You'll also get these in arc normal structures too. So at Staveley, as our fluids have evolved from the magmatic source up into that structure, they've changed to a higher sulfidation state fluid, which, well, fluid that produces higher sulfidation state copper mineral. So we've gone from our pyrite to chalcopyrite, then bornite and chalcosite. So our copper content has increased and our bornite will host some gold. If in a dilatant structure, those fluids continue to evolve, we go into covalite at the transition to an epithermal and finally a high sulfidation epithermal with some advanced argillic alteration uh, where the gold's associated with energite. Now, funny that Roger should have mentioned the magma vein. If you go back through the 1960s literature, you can see the magma vein was actually a pyritic D vein that evolved to marginal sphalerite that's overprinted by chalcopyrite, then bornite, then chalcosite, and a bit of energite down the bottom coming in late stage. But that's over a two kilometer strike and a kilometer vertical distance, and there's our 1.3 million tons of copper at 4.9%. Why such a great system? Because it's in a wonderful dilatant structural environment. The post-mineral cover obscures our plan view a bit, but if we look at the cross section through here, the magma vines vein is in a graben bounding structure. And then in the center of that graben, a wonderful dilatant setting, we've got the giant resolution system, which stretches from its magmatic source 
as sheeted veins up into the competent diapase. Now that water that Roger referred to, these overlying sediments would be really porous. And so that's why they'd be having trouble sinking shafts through that. So our original hypotheses set up circulating cells of magmatic meteoric waters, which bled our volatiles, particularly SO2, up to here. So those volatiles there oxidize to form a sink of high temperature acid waters sitting above our porphyry. But as this cools, those circulating cells reversed and under the influence of drawdown, those hot acid fluids have collapsed upon our pre-existing porphyry, particularly down the margins. And so Dave Lowell's model would come through here uh, to produce our overprinting philic alteration. So philic alteration destroys the earlier minerals and produces silica, sericite, the pyrite, the magnetite from the earlier event is destroyed and deposits abundant pyrite seen here. So when we're using our magnetic imagery to explore, we've got to remember that our prograde porphyry will be magnetic, changing with depth, but our retrograde porphyry will have variable magnetic signature from that magnetic magnetite destruction, but it will be chargeable because of all that pyrite. Now, on Terry Leach's figure that illustrates the minerals in epithermal and porphyry systems, plotting increasing pH versus increasing temperature. In a relatively neutral fluid, we get a high temperature porphyry going out to our inner propylitic alteration at lower temperature, and then our outer propylitic alteration as the temperature declines even further. In our more acidic environment, we've got our philic alteration going up to cooler argilic alteration. But if the low temperature fluids I mentioned earlier that form our philic alteration become really acidic, um, the high temperature is, yeah, low pH fluids, become really acidic, we can form a zone of advanced argilic alteration within our philic alteration, which is a porphyry lithocap and collapses upon a porphyry and they're often used as vectors to porphyry. Greg, can I ask you to wind up in the next minute or so, please, mate? Yeah, we'll do that. Um, I've lost my plot. So at this stage, we've got uplift and erosion. And during that uplift and erosion, we develop our, our, our leached cap as, because the pyrite in that philic alteration oxidizes to give us highly acidic groundwaters and forms our chalcosite blanket that migrates down and improves, such as at Marenzi during continuing uplift and erosion. Whereas in a, in a system without the philic alteration, we would chase overprinting porphyry intrusions such as at Ridgeway, Ridgeway to give us multiple events of mineralization. So conclusions, our staged model for porphyry development allows us to understand the overprinting features. Dave Lowell's model was good, but it's a long time ago. Um, the out of porphyry geological features act as vectors towards mineralization. I like to prospect dilatant portions of major structures. Where to now? Outcropping porphyries are being found in poorly prospected terrains with the help of those vectors, such as in Ecuador. Brownfields prospecting continues to reward careful geology and perhaps looking at Stavely in a Cambrian arc where we might look at a few older rocks and for instance the 27 million ounce Bonington porphyry as an Archean port, but Bonington gold deposit as an Archean porphyry. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Dr. Greg Corbett.